You nearly got a $1 million fine and nearly got put in jail. Two enforcement agents from the government came into the back, put in jail for up to a year and fined up to a million dollars. When I was like 23, 24, I'd smoke like four or five joints a day. I just really enjoyed weed, was really high functional around it. Kind of was running a business that was running me into the ground. The mission at Herb is to change the way the world views cannabis. 40,000 people that are locked up in the US. Testosterone is a chemical, especially in men, that makes effort feel good. A lot of founders struggle with things like loneliness. We live in a day and age where you should ask yourself before you're hiring, how could this be automated. What's up, guys, and welcome back to First Things First. Very happy to have our guest here today, Matt Gray. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. You have recently just moved to Dubai, fresh from Toronto? Fresh off the plane. I was in uh, LA before this, but yeah, originally from Toronto. So yeah, yeah. look forward to being here and excited to uh, embark on this new journey. Yeah, man. I was I was having a look at your socials and what you do, and it's, it's really impressive, particularly with the... Uh, the stuff you're putting on Instagram, it's very cool. The the motion graphics and I, as I was doing research for this episode, I was actually learning a hell of a lot just going through all of it. So uh, it's good stuff. Yeah, thanks. No, it's been a fun journey. And yeah, me and the team behind Founder OS just enjoy kind of putting out stuff that we would want to see and, you know, putting kind of the quality and the design before anything else. And yeah, so I know it's been a fun journey. How, uh, how did you get started? I guess you you born and bred in Canada. Born and bred in Canada, yeah, from a small town north of Toronto uh, called Newmarket, Ontario. Uh, and oldest of five kids, went to business school, spent four years in business school. It was a bit of a scam. You know, you end up kind of going through, they try to push mm. you to be a consultant, an investment banker, a marketer, or whatever. And none of these things really fit what I was trying to do. I had originally gone there to become an entrepreneur. And so, yeah, one thing led to another, graduated, started working a miserable job at Kraft Foods. Uh, managing a territory of grocery stores and it really hated my life. Um, I started trying a bunch of different things and uh, started learning how to code um, and had met some other friends that we kind of came up with the idea of creating a technology school essentially uh, for people to learn how to code and then get jobs in different tech companies across Canada. And so when I was 21, uh, me and a few co-founders uh, all started a school called Bitmaker and uh, we trained over 2,000 software engineers over the course of three years, taught them Ruby on Rails, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and then would host a job fair at the end of every cohort, which was about three months long. And 90% uh, of the graduates were getting jobs within one month. And so, uh, yeah, it did really well. And uh, the business was acquired by General Assembly. Um, after that, I really had a desire to kind of go and travel the world and not be stuck in one location. And Bitmaker, while it was a great experience, was something that was like a brick and mortar school in Toronto. To expand it, we had to start other brick and mortar locations. And I knew that whatever I did next, I wanted to kind of have the freedom to, you know, work where I want, when I want, on what I want with whoever I want. Um, and so uh, one thing led to another, saw the writing on the wall in the cannabis industry and uh, came across this website called the Stoner's Cookbook. It was a user generated recipe site with 100,000 people a month on it and 100,000 people on a Facebook page it had, but hadn't made any money. It was kind of a hobby website. Uh, one thing led to another. I bought that website uh, and then I rebranded it to Herb. Um, and we started kind of pushing content around brands, dispensaries, uh, strains, best ofs, how to's, just anything that that market would be interested in. And uh, we've now grown it to an audience of 14 million people, uh, work with the best brands in the space. And yeah, that's kind of a bit of my journey then leading up to Founder OS, which I started two years ago now uh, to help founders with proven systems get to $5 million a year in revenue and beyond. So yeah, lots lots to unpack there, I'm sure, but that's kind of a bit of the journey. It's pretty impressive. Thanks. So uh, what, what got you into coding? So I'd like to say it was like some magical experience or something, but honestly, just from being tired of my current situation, I just like, at the time was selling craft dinner and managing this like territory of, uh, grocery stores it's, after graduating. It's, it's, craft, it's a big company in America. It's a big company. Yeah. Yeah. But just, it was miserable. And so I was working there and I just knew I had to get out of it. Like I had to change the current situation of my life. You know, I was, I felt like I was meant for much more than doing that. And I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I figured if I can just start acquiring different skills, um, something's got to happen. So I made an effort to meet a bunch of different people around Toronto and the startup scene. I made an effort just to pick up skills like coding and other things. And uh, one thing led to another and yeah, I ended up kind of starting a school around that. So 
I'd love to say that was a superpower of mine, but yes, it was a, a skill that I kind of learned over the course of maybe a year. And yeah. then, you know, I don't code anymore though or anything. But the, was the, the skills you acquired coding, did you use that into building the, the platform that was educating people? Yeah. So certainly part of it, yeah. uh, I mean, the big thing that I've learned in life is like the importance of who, not how. Mm. And so by no means after learning how to code for a year, am I qualified to go and teach thousands of people um, how to go code. Uh, but I was able to find really qualified senior engineers from the Toronto startup community uh, to become instructors and develop the course for the people. So uh, we started collaborating with different, you know, really talented people around Toronto to go and develop this curriculum that would go help people learn how to code. And I was more responsible for kind of assembling the team, building up the business, uh, hiring people, um, and yeah, the more business side of the operation uh, while the curriculum was made by kind of subject matter experts. Mm. I noticed you, you, you said somewhere that you nearly got a $1 million fine and nearly got put in jail. Was that, was that relating to BitMaker? Yeah. What's that about? Yeah, so pretty crazy story. One of the most like wild experiences of my life. So um, everything was going great at BitMaker. You know, we had graduated thousands of people. We were helping them get great jobs. Everything looked rosy. Uh, one week I was uh, interviewed by a local kind of Canadian newspaper called The Globe Mail. Um, they wanted to do a profile piece uh, on the business that we had built and, you know, uh, the success that it had. And so a couple of weeks later, that piece comes out, all is good. People congratulating me saying, oh, great business you built, like love what you're doing for the community, all this good stuff. And uh, it was like a Wednesday one day, uh, an average day at the office, just doing our thing, building the business, building out the community and uh, helping people out. And uh, two enforcement agents uh, from the government came into the back of the school, asked who runs this. And I was like, I, I run this, like, how can we help you sort of thing? And they're like, uh, we're investigating you as being an unregistered private career college. Uh, you know, after looking at things, it looks like uh, you never basically got a certificate to be a university. Mm. And because of that, uh, you need to shut down. So much as marketing this website is illegal and you'll be fined $5,000 a day. You can be put in jail for up to a year and fined up to a million dollars if you continue this. And I was like, at first, like just completely shocked, like just like, what is going on? And I ended up uh, talking to some different lawyers around Toronto being like, what the heck do I do here? Like, we've been doing a good thing. We've been helping people out. All of this is great. Like, I'm shocked that like, what is going on? Uh, because yeah, we weren't giving out degrees we were not promising to be a university. We were just getting people skills and then getting them jobs. That was it. Mm -hmm. There was no report cards, grades. We were not a university. We were not a college. So one thing led to another. What I realized was that lawyers were just going to tell us to shut down. The prospects looked grim and I could either shut down, give up and just call it a day or I could fight. And the reality was like, I knew that what we were building was something amazing that was gonna help a lot of people, had already helped thousands of people. Um, and it was time to really mobilize that community uh, that we had built. And so uh, I shut down the school on the Thursday and told people like, hey, when you ever back up, backs up against the wall, like we'll always come through, give us like two days to solve this thing. Mm -hmm. How many people were on board at that point? There were about 50 people in the school um, and there were around eight staff. Mm -hmm. um, so still humble, uh, yeah. but you know, they had invested in us really helping them. And uh, yeah, it was something that like, we couldn't let these people down. And so over the course of the next 48 hours, I emailed over 3000 people, um, any, you know, startup founder I could think of across North America, any venture capitalist, just anyone that I thought could help. Um, and uh, within 24 hours, it was trending on Twitter in Canada. Uh, and we had people tweeting out like, you know, Paul Graham, founder of Y Combinator, Vinod Kosla, founder of Sun Microsystems, um, and just everyone just with like kind of an outrage and a rally call being like, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. um, and so I also at the time, uh, you know, again, just had the email or found the email of Chamath Polyapatia, uh, the guy behind growing Facebook from a million users to a billion. He was going to be speaking at a conference about an hour away. I got his email, emailed him, said, hey, this is what's going on. I'd love to come travel out to you and get some help with this. Like, this is crazy. I, I could use your hand. He said, yeah, come out and grab me. So went to the conference an hour away from Toronto, 
after he was done speaking, went for a walk through Ottawa with him to kind of talk about what had gone on. We sat down for breakfast. I told him what had happened. He's like, fuck that. You know, you, you're you telling me you built this thing, you're helping people like this. I've invested $30 million in Ontario over the last year in the startup ecosystem, and this is how they're treating innovation. And so long story short, the next day I was on a call with the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities that Chamath helped connect. That guy's on the call saying, you shouldn't have had to deal with this in the first place. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on. We apologize, like, let us solve this. And by that Friday, uh, we got the only exemption for the business of its kind in Canada and we're back in business. Um, and so, yeah, that whole experience kind of taught me like the power of community mm -hmm. and the power of like a strong mission, you know? Um, when you have something, you build a mission, you build a movement around something. I think you can withstand these kind of tests or crucibles of leadership that may come up when you're building something because we all face adversity in, in what we do. Um, yeah, and you, know, you almost need to expect the unexpected. Yeah, like how exactly. on earth would you know that that's gonna oh, happen? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, so yeah, super unexpected. Uh, was like borderline traumatizing at 21, just thinking like everything's you, good. You're only 21. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 21, and you know, and then to have to go through this, and it was a very public thing, you know, because uh, yeah, you know, obviously I'd emailed 3,000 people letting them know that this was going on, so yeah. it really went public. Um, but you know, grateful to be able to look back on it, and you know, great lesson. We were able to then build the successful business, be able to sell it, um, and get a good outcome for everyone. So. Yeah, that was a crazy moment in my life. Is there anything when you were kind of, you know, early starting on, like you've been in the game for a bit, like any sort of moment you're like, damn, like I look back on that. That was a moment when I was really young that really tested me. I think there was, when I when I had a gym, there was just a lot of unexpected fees, uh, which I didn't take into account. I remember that we had some bailiffs come knocking on the door <laughs> of the gym and they were demanding like tens of thousands of pounds Okay, for... I think it was like some sort of council tax fee, okay. which we didn't even know we had to pay. Yeah. And at the time we didn't have the money to pay for that. Wow. So we had to get, um, we had to get a loan off my business partner's dad so that we could pay them off. And then we could keep the place open and just keep running business as usual. Obviously we managed to pay him back, but it was a scary moment where we just thought like, holy shit, like we might have to close the gym down. Yeah. And I was, at, I think we were both only 23 at the time. So I remember when I wanted to open the gym, I, you know, when you have something in your mind where you're like, this is something I'm going to do. Nobody can tell me otherwise. And I remember like I was getting advice from people. Even my dad was saying like, it's a bit of a, it's a risky thing to get involved with because you, you now all of a sudden have all these overheads. You have no experience of doing anything like this before. Like how much money do you really have to spend? Because we didn't have a huge amount of money. We just kind of saved it up from all the money we were earning from being a personal trainer. We just put it into opening this gym. Right. So, um, yeah, that was, I, I guess that was pretty scary. But I mean, there's always points when I, when I look back throughout my life where things have got extremely tight. Yeah. And you just think, oh, like this is, this is, this is going to end very badly. But the good thing is, which you, you probably have the same mindset as well. It's that I always just think everything's going to be okay. Yeah. Like everything always figures itself out. Mm -hmm. And when you look back at it, it doesn't really seem to be that bad Yeah, in the long run. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, yeah, it's these like crucible moments as you're building something that your back's up against the wall that I think it really shows you. And that's what, you know, what you're made you. of. That's what, yeah, it, that's what gives you character and tests you. Yeah. And you'll see how you'll, really react under pressure yeah 100 percent. that separates the the boys from the men mm -hmm. um how old were you when you made the exit 24. so still fairly young yeah so I, how, how did that feel yeah i mean i imagine it was like a, a great relief and I mean, like was nice to kind of there's a nice cap on that journey and like a way good right way to end it and rewarding um at the same token and we were talking about this before we started uh, you know it was my first business. And so I really had no clue what I was doing. And I really ground myself into the ground. Like I kind of was running a business that was running me into the ground basically and didn't take much care of my health. Ended that experience feeling pretty like down and out, like pretty anxious, pretty depressed. Um, and yeah, just burnt out. And so it was a giant relief to, you know, sell it and get out of it. Um, and at the same token, um, it gave me a lot of realizations to like what I really wanted to build in life, which was, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a great business that I could operate anywhere in the world, um, have more freedom, 
uh, not have to be like in one place with an in, in an in-person location, in an office all the time building something. I had much more of a desire to go and travel. Uh, you know, when I had graduated through university, you know, for four months, I had gone and traveled through 23 countries across Europe and Southeast Asia. And it was one of the most like transformative experiences of my life, just seeing all these different cultures and different ways of living and just mm -hmm. being out in nature and exploring and the adventure of it all. And I knew that once I had gotten out of Bitmaker, I was like, okay, I want to get back to that. Like that to me is like the zest of life. That's what it's all about is like exploring, getting outside, experiencing different cultures and mm -hmm. building along the way something special. And so um, that was kind of an exciting prospect once I sold it to be able to go and get back to my roots and what brings me true happiness. I think that's, that's one of the best things. I always recommend people to travel, but it's even better if you can travel while still making money. Yeah. And that's, one of the reasons you know when i had that gym and i was a, i was a full-time personal trainer and i wasn't making money doing anything else like everything was very heavily reliant upon me being there in the gym training my clients so anytime i took a vacation the income my income dropped to pretty much zero and i used to like as much as i loved to travel i was getting agitated because like oh here, here i am spending but i'm not earning so i would you know my trips would probably only be able to be like a week at a time and i'd have to go back and then just be in the gym all day, every day. And I thought, hang on, this is not the life I want to live. I want to be able to, like you, travel, work when I want. I was I was never really afraid of working, but I just wanted to be able to choose mm -hmm. when it was that I wanted to work. So I go through periods of, okay, a couple of weeks, maybe in a couple of months, head down, all I'm going to do is work. But if I feel like I don't want to do that anymore, I like to have that option to just have a bit of time off for a yeah. week or a couple of weeks. And I think traveling and seeing the world is probably really is one of the best things you can do for personal growth Yeah, and knowing what you like, what you don't like, learning how other people live, even being in relationships with women from different cultures. You, you learn a lot about what you like, don't like in a partner. For sure. Yeah, no, I think travel is one of the best mentors. And so, yeah, no, when I started Herb, I then kind of found myself in New Zealand for a couple months, backpacking through New Zealand, went to Indonesia, Thailand, uh, ended up traveling all through the States and Mexico and Peru and Colombia. And yeah, just was kind of building this online community while traveling. And yeah, I agree. Were, like, were you documenting it whilst you were traveling? Uh, so I actually would say that's one of the big mistakes that I made. Like I was documenting a bit just for my personal use, but uh, I largely had this belief at that time that it's kind of like put the brand that you're building before everything else. Mm -hmm. And so Herb was the company uh, and is the company and the brand. And I just put everything into that. And it was great. Like it obviously worked to build this audience of 14 million, uh, but I didn't really document much around my own journey too much or share too many learnings and build my own personal brand much. Uh, because again, it was just kind of all about Herb. And over the last few years, I've kind of changed my mindset on that, it really seems pretty obvious uh, that there's a huge amount of leverage to be had by not only building your company brand, but also building your own personal brand. Um, and you don't need to do it the way other people do it. You know, I think a lot of people think to themselves, you know, I don't wanna be famous or I don't wanna be like that guy. It's like, don't be like that guy or girl, you know, do it you your way, you know? Yeah. You, know um, you don't have to share everything yeah, about your personal life. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so more recently then been sharing more of that journey. But back then it was no, just kind of everything around Herb uh, and making that the centerpiece of it all. Well, the, the only problem with documenting your travels and that journey you were on is instead of you being 100% present in the moment, experiencing what you're experiencing, sometimes when you feel as though there's that requirement to vlog and document it, you're no longer living that experience for yourself but it's mm. more so for the viewers. And it's sometimes, I've experienced it a lot when I travel, it, it doesn't feel like time off or like a vacation. And sometimes I can't fully be in the present because I have to constantly be documenting and thinking about, oh, well, what does the viewer want yeah. to see? Like what's gonna be the most engaging mm -hmm. thing to do? And you almost have to like constantly be thinking how this video is gonna pan out. And then in reality, you don't actually have that time to switch off. Yeah. But I mean, the times when I have gone and I've traveled and I've documented, I've been so glad that I documented. Mm -hmm. And there's places I've been to where I decided, no, no, I'm not, not going to vlog this. I'm just going to have this time to be present either in the moment or with the person I'm with. And then I come back and I'm like, fuck, I should have, I should have documented that because it would have been yeah. such a good video. And then you always have the, uh, you've got the memory 
it's there like forever and you can look back at it which i'm sure i will do when i'm older even like my kids will be able to see mm -hmm. what i got up to when i was younger so i still i mean obviously if you go and traveling with a team of people that makes it a hell of a lot easier but if you're going out there and you're doing it all yourself yeah it's tricky because I'm, I'm the type of person that i hate walking around with a camera and i hate yeah. having to have all the equipment and like make sure all the batteries are charged and all of that like it's it's a headache but it's yeah. it's worth it though well yeah i think that's the underbelly and kind of the dark side if you will of the experience sometimes of being a creator especially i think when people are getting started they think it's easy to for it to become this kind of always on thing mm -hmm. right that like it's so hard just to switch off because you feel like you just constantly got to be creating and sharing and shooting and publishing and it can become pretty exhausting and i think a lot of people i speak to before they know it accidentally kind of fall into a content hamster wheel mm -hmm. whereby they just are constantly just trying to feed these platforms the content and are on a kind of a fast track to burnout and so yeah, one thing I've learned over the last bit, even from building Herb and other content companies is the importance of really batching that content. The reality is like, if you can just put your brain into kind of shooting and creating mode, maybe for a couple days, maybe of the month, you should be able to kind of batch enough content, hopefully, uh, to get you through sort of the next 30 to 60 days. Um, and thereby, like anything else that you do while you're on vacation or whatever else is just bonus stuff. Yeah. It's not like this is a necessity because on Sunday, something needs to go out and I got nothing, mm -hmm. you know? And it's that constant, feeling like you're on a treadmill, I feel like yeah. that becomes really exhausting. I used to be very strict and disciplined with sticking to a deadline yeah, and a schedule, which I think is sometimes needed, especially if you really want to grow to begin with. But sometimes it can become very stressful if you are getting extremely close to that deadline mm -hmm. and you're like, oh my God, there's all these things I need to do. And then you just end up being extremely stressed out for like a day or two days, making sure everything is done and ready to post. Yeah. So it's it's finding the balance, I guess. You know, it, it is good to have a deadline, but if it's going to make your life a living hell, then maybe just go a little bit easy on yourself. Yeah. I mean, one thing I've learned over the years too is that at the end of the day, any big returns in life, whether it's through relationships or from business or from creating content or whatever it may be, it all comes in the long term. And if you're going to stay in something for the long term, right? Like you got to enjoy what you're doing and you got to keep it like fun. You got to keep it sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think, you know, I deal with the same thing. Like I'm very much like a type A personality, like, like to make sure I'm hitting certain deadlines and hitting certain requirements. But yeah, it's that balance. I think sometimes that if it's kind of like taking a step back and, you know, if it's not going to bug you in five minutes, then mm. or it's not going to bug you in five years and don't spend five minutes on it kind of thing. What, what did, uh, what does Herb do? How did that come about? So the mission at Herb is to change the way the world views cannabis. Uh, in the cannabis space, uh, you can't advertise as a brand uh, because on Facebook, on Instagram, on Google, because it's a schedule one drug in the US. Does that, does the same applies for TV as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, cannabis is as illegal as heroin. Um, cocaine in the US, right? So you can't advertise it on most places. So it's very hard for these brands in the space to go and get themselves out there and to create a brand and to drive customers and drive awareness. And so my belief when I'm building any business is that you wanna build distribution day one. Um, and you hear that kind of saying, first time founders focus on tech, second time founders focus on distribution. And so for me, whenever I'm building something day one, I wanna set the audience on fire and build the biggest community, the biggest movement, the biggest audience around what that thing is, because I feel like only good things happen from that. And I think you're a shining example of this, just the amount of leverage that's built mm. from building a movement, from serving people and building an audience. And so with Herb, we set out just to build the largest, most engaged cannabis community in the world. And we did that. And in a space that's rifled with sketchy platforms, weird people, nefarious characters, mm -hmm. we just built a great company. Uh, from day one, our goal was just like, let's just build a great company that just so happens to be in cannabis. And so it was about, you know, creating something that uh, stood for like really great quality um, that we, uh, you know, could really help brands and. Essentially what we built uh, inside of it, uh, beyond just the community, um, is a product called CMAS, which stands for Cannabis Marketing as a Service. And so a combination of SEO, a programmatic ad uh, technology we built, as well as a 
uh, a piece of tech that allows us to convert uh, anonymous website traffic to emails. And so uh, for these cannabis brands that are looking to grow, we're able to clearly show them uh, a lot of like awareness and growth and then show them through our dashboards, how we're able to convert that traffic essentially through to transactions. Mm -hmm. And so almost like a Google analytics for weed, uh, that doesn't exist in this space uh, because of the rules that exist, uh, but because we own this audience and we have all this data uh, around all of these people that love weed, uh, we are a platform that can kind of dictate our own rules and we help these brands grow based off of the audience we've created. That's pretty cool. So yeah. you, you never, you didn't go down the route of actually selling no. a product no. or weed, but creating this community. Yeah. That's, that's cool. Yeah, we went a very different route with it. So we, you know. Was there a reason behind that? I think it's uh, early on, and by no means are we even close to these companies, but just this thesis of, you know, the biggest transportation company in the world is Uber. They don't own a single car. The biggest accommodation company in the world is Airbnb. They don't own a single room, hotel, apartment. And the biggest cannabis company in the world isn't gonna actually own a cultivation facility or a dispensary. It's gonna be an online platform helping connect brands with consumers. And so it was utilizing that sort of thesis uh, by which like we would build this online platform, online community, make amazing content that resonated with that community and then put brands into it to grow. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, that's how we wanted to build it. And that was also my interest too, after kind of getting out of BitMaker, I knew there was no way I was gonna do something that now required me to, you know, open up a massive cultivation facility or be stuck in LA or anywhere. I wanted to build something online. Mm -hmm. So it also just fit my needs in life as a founder. Um, I knew I wanted to have the freedom to travel anywhere. Is this something that will become a better case scenario for you if it becomes legalized in more places? Yeah, so. Yeah. Or if it, say for example, they decide, oh, it's actually now legal to advertise cannabis on TV, social media, how would that affect Herb? Yeah, so I think either way we're good. I think we've built a pretty anti-fragile business. So like mm -hmm. either way it goes, will be great. Uh, in the case that it stays the way it is, we're doing phenomenal. And you know, the business does eight figures and beyond a year. It's super profitable and like doing great. We've got an unbelievable team of marketers and uh, technologists and people just, you know, that really love this stuff and it cranks. Mm -hmm. In this case where it, it suddenly the tides tip a lot, which we've been waiting for for some time, but you know, it just takes a while. Yeah. Uh, will be even better, I'm sure, just yeah. because it's now that much more adopted and there's that much more, you know, there's that many more brands that are now able to get in the space and the uh, ability for those brands to deploy different techniques will widen. And we've kind of got this like, you know, I started it 10 years ago now, so we've got a 10 year head start and have the ability to kind of adapt as the regulations change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where is it currently legal? It's I, legal in Canada, where I'm from. So we were the first G8 country to completely federally legalize cannabis. What, what year was that? Uh, 2019, I believe. Yeah. Don't quote me on that, but that's what yeah. I'm pretty sure. Um, and then uh, I believe it's legal across 21 states in the US uh, and you know, growing by the year. Uh, so yeah, it's one of those things that I think a lot of people predicted under Biden, it would get completely legalized, but that hasn't manifested. So. That said, like, I don't think that's stuff we can control. I've always just focused on, you know, the things that we can control in the business, which is just building a great team, building a great product, making the customers really happy and things have kind of just compounded. Oh yeah, it says here, October 17th, 2018. Okay, 18. Interesting. Were you, were you in Canada at the time? At that time, yeah. What was it like? <laughs> you was know, it, was there like a change overnight or was everything fairly similar? I would say it's pretty overrated overall. Uh, and here's why, um, in the US, uh, the laws uh, treat cannabis in the states that are legal, almost like alcohol. So like there's quite like cool brands, cool ways of packaging it. And it's like, it's kind of, uh, it's how you'd expect a CPG product to be. In Canada, they approached it like uh, cigarettes and like tobacco. So big warning symbols, no branding, super sterile. So, and so- what, what, it, were they, what were they saying though? Like this will like what is the what, i don't know there's a huge amount of negative side effects of smoking weed so how are they trying to deter people 
from smoking it. Yeah, I guess it's just one of these things where, I mean, there, there's definitely like anything, right? There's negative side effects, but I mean, overall, it's, I think, a, a fine thing and humans and adults should be able to make choices yeah. that work for them like anything. And so, yeah, there's the government's take on it and the laws they made just more closely resembled uh, cigarettes mm -hmm. uh, and try, you know, kind so of, we're gonna loads. legalize it, but we're gonna keep it out of the hands of children and we don't want it to get widespread and we wanna keep it very kind of, yeah, like cigarettes. And so, uh, you know, big warning labels, like a logo this big on packaging, just very sterile and boring. So mm -hmm. uh, I think most Canadians would say the industry didn't amount to what we thought it might. It kind of honestly has been rather cold in Canada, I would say. So we focus mostly on the US uh, where I think, you know, places like LA, Colorado, New York City uh, will be the hub of the industry long-term. Um, and, you know, Canada is, you know, a 12th of the size of the US and the laws are super backwards. And so I don't think uh, it'll amount to much in Canada. You the laws are backwards where? In Canada, really? well, with cannabis, especially. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, other things too, but yeah. that, but yeah, just talking about that right now. Yeah, I think, I don't, I don't see, I mean, I've, I've smoked it. Um, my tolerance is extremely low. So whatever I do, I'm like super, super high. But in comparison to alcohol, I feel as though the 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 side effects that people get um, are nowhere near as dangerous or as damaging um, when you compare it to alcohol. People just kind of chill out and eat a lot of food and just yeah. do their own thing. Whereas when people drink, uh, you know, they often get aggressive. Their senses are impaired. You know, a lot of negative things come about from that. So I wouldn't be surprised if it becomes more legalized. I don't think it will do here. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I guess we'll see where that goes. Yeah. Is, is there something, are you hoping that it will become more uh, available and legalized? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think inevitably, I think it's good if, you know, adults can make decisions for themselves around what they want to put in their body like most things i think that like mm -hmm. that freedom to have the choice is good i also am really against people getting locked up for it which i think is the again the dark side of making it illegal right mm -hmm. you have like forty thousand people that are locked up in the us for cannabis for just having like a couple grams in their pocket and they're locked up for 10 years beyond right which that doesn't seem right mm -hmm. um and they affect a lot of minorities and uh, it's pretty sad, you know, seeing these like really unjust laws and in one state it's completely legal and people are good. And then you have other states where people are locked up for life for a minor possession. And so I'm really passionate about that going away. Mm. Um, and then from there, adults making whatever choice is right for them. My own, own cannabis use has been quite sort of like, you know, it's been quite the story or experience over my life. Uh, you know, when I was like 23, 24, I'd smoke like four or five joints a day most days, Whoa. at <laughs> least. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I just really enjoyed weed, was really high functional around it. Um, and yeah, just, you know, it was kind of my, like my thing. Um, and it was about four or five years ago, um, in a back and forth, you know, messaging conversation with Andrew Huberman after an episode he had done on cannabis, I was open, it opened my eyes to some of the science and the effects behind it in ways that not many people may know about, which is, um, I learned that, uh, cannabis affects the, uh, the transfer of DHEA transforming into testosterone and it breaks that chain. And so what will happen in a cannabis user oftentimes is they'll get the buildup of DHEA, but it won't convert to testosterone. So your testosterone will be low. And I didn't know, but testosterone is a chemical, especially in men that makes effort feel good. And, you know, we're busy founders, we're doing lots of stuff. There's mm -hmm. tough times, good times, like we work pretty hard. And I was figuring like, oh my God, if I have low testosterone because of this, that's really gonna affect my ability just to you know, feel good for all this effort I'm putting towards the movement, the business, the community I'm building. And so sure enough, I got my blood work done um, and my testosterone levels were around like the 270 range and they should have been in the 900 plus range. And so um, I experimented and kind of gamified my sobriety, uh, stopped alcohol, stopped cannabis use, um, no, I have nothing against it. Just again, that was what it felt right for me. And I just wanted to gamify it for a minute to see, hey, if I stop this, what will happen to my hormone levels? Uh, sure enough, three months later, my testosterone was at like 830. So it basically tripled. Mm -hmm. um, I felt just a level of vitality that I hadn't felt in a minute and figured, huh, like this is pretty good. Um, so kind of have you know not consumed cannabis, not consumed alcohol in about four years now. Four years, wow. Yeah. Do you think it's something that you'll never touch again? Uh, I don't know about never touch again, but yeah, no, I, I'll be 
you know, pretty sober the rest of my life. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you know anything about what causes people to, to function or be high functioning when they smoke versus being low functioning? Like, do you know what that is? Is that like something to do with just building up a tolerance and then kind of forcing yourself to do normal things? Cause I know some people, they like to smoke and then they'll go to the gym or they'll smoke and like yeah. do work. But anytime, anytime I had done it, I, I could not do a single thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if it was something that's genetics or yeah. whether you just have to build up that tolerance and actually get up and do stuff. Yeah. I think the brain is a pretty complex thing, you know, and how then this chemical of cannabis mixes with an individual's brain. For some people, it's like leads to creativity and uh, productivity and just like relaxation and whatever else, right? And and for others, it can instigate a you know bit of anxiety or uh, sleep or whatever maybe. And some of those feelings may be desirable, and some of them may be sort of stuff that people don't enjoy. And so, yeah, um, yeah I'm not sure totally the science behind all of those like variations and how it reacts, but yeah, I think it's just important, like anything, right? Like see how something reacts with you. And if it's good and it's positive, then sure, like continue. And if it's something that like eventually, like you're saying, right? Like just makes you wanna go to sleep. But meanwhile, you're trying to make it to the gym every day, then yeah, probably not conducive to that lifestyle. Does does Herb run itself now, pretty much? Or do you have still quite a lot of input with that on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so uh, around uh, three years ago, um, I had done a bunch of soul searching. Um, and uh, completed uh, my ikigai, uh, which for those that don't know, it's a Japanese saying that stands for your calling in life. Uh, and it sits at the intersection of what you love to do, what you can be paid for, what the world needs and what you're good at. And so this like intersection of those four quadrants is your ikigai, which is your calling in life and is the things that if you can optimize those and lean into those in life, the things that are gonna gotta give you the best like energy and really just you know fire you up at the end of the day. And so, um, for me and my icky guy sat things like helping founders, you know, building systems, um, automating things, uh, helping, um, you know, the future generation of people that were in similar positions to I was when I was starting, uh, you know, building communities and so on. And so I knew where my superpowers lied and like the things that I really enjoyed doing. Um, and I had the desire to kind of go and create a community around those things now. Um, Herb at that time had now been operating for eight years. I had built the systems in it that it basically ran on autopilot. Um, we had great people, great systems, great automations, and it was just growing steadily at about you know eighty to one hundred percent year over year, just steady. And so um, I brought on you know a chief of staff um, and people on the operations side to basically reduce my hours from forty hours a week uh, to you know ten hours a week to four hours a week to about an hour a week, um, and you know I basically got it where it runs on autopilot and I could just spend like a couple hours a month on it. Um, and, you know, just supporting people here, there with questions they have and being there for the leadership team. And I've really directed my focus now to founder OS, mm -hmm. uh, which was born from that icky guy exercise. And just like what I knew my calling in life was to do over the next hundred years till I die, uh, which is to, yeah, really help the builders, the dreamers, the founders of the world. I think that, uh, you know, building a business is like one of the hardest experiences you can go through in life, you know? Uh, and I think a lot of founders struggle with things like loneliness um, and overwhelm um, and just a lack of clarity. Uh, and so what I've learned over the years is like a bunch of systems to help founders like grow their audience on autopilot, build out big content engines in their business. Over the years, similar to you, I've never bought an ad. Uh, I've built all these communities organically through just great content and a great mission. And so um, I wanted to go and empower more founders to do the same uh, in what they were building. And so, uh, yeah, over the last like couple of years, we've grown it to over 2 million founders. Um, and uh, we, you know, it's our goal really is to build the greatest founder community and education platform in the world. And so, uh, yeah, that has been kind of a fun There's journey. Too many, 2 million people have signed up. 2 million people in the audience. We have like 150,000 on the email list and uh, every year right now, I mean, I mean, it's just, it's again, a pretty young company. So mm -hmm. over the last year, I think 3,500 founders have gone through it. Wow. Yeah. And all the content, is it being created by you? Or have you got other founders chip in with their expertise? Yeah. yeah. So I create a bunch of it. We also have other instructors, um, you know, that kind of specialize in different aspects. So our whole thing is kind of that success is an OS um, and that there are operating systems you can put into place in the different aspects of your business to, you know, set them apart. When I was kind of like building businesses early on, 
I had different mentors or advisors that would tell me things to do, but I always felt like it was like very high level. And I was like, okay, so like, what do I actually do? Um, and I kind of promised myself when I finally got to, you know, building businesses and became successful that I would go and help people actually like with the what, not just the why. Mm -hmm. um, and there's enough theory out there, but I feel like there's sometimes like a need for people right on the ground floor that have been in the trenches just to say exactly like what to do and how to do it. And so, yeah, that's what we focus a lot on is like that. So we have myself, different instructors that are specialists in, you know, whether it's funnels, copywriting, automation, the tech side of things, launching, you know, any kind of business, whether it's courses, coaches, SaaS businesses. So helping a broad range of people build what I call like a founder flywheel. So kind of setting up their personal brand, which then feeds their business brand, generates cash flows, generates referrals, and kind of allows you to then reinvest in that sort of engine in your business mm. uh, so that you know, you can really scale things. I think the future of brands are founder led. Again, I think you're a great example of that. Uh, you know, people know you and then they kind of follow your brands and your, you know, um, your app and all these things. And then I think the future of entrepreneurship too is that um, every company is a media company. And yeah. so I think all of us at some point are gonna kind of become attuned to the fact that like organic content, creating a podcast, building a YouTube, starting building on X, starting a LinkedIn, whatever it may be, whatever's right for you, um, is a massive unlock. And not just for clients or cash flows or nothing like that. Um, while that's true, yes, it's also great for building a community. Uh, it's great for being a talent magnet. Uh, for those that are looking to raise investment, it's great for that as well. So it just builds an enormous amount of leverage. And I think founders are missing out if they're not building that piece of their engine. How do people find the Ikigai? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think the ideal way to, I mean, there's the exercise of Ikigai that I think anyone can go and find and start wherever you are uh, going through that, you know, taking a weekend away, going into nature, unplugging, maybe with just a pen, a paper, and then familiarizing yourself with the exercise, which is again, pretty simple, just four circles, what you're good at, what you can be paid for, what the world needs. Um, and yeah, basically just like starting with a pen and paper. And I think it's like most things, it's not that all the answers are gonna come to you in one go. Mm -hmm. It's just by nature of sort of thinking about this, journaling a little bit. I think inevitably that like writing breeds clarity. And so just like getting off your computer, getting off screens, writing down like what stuff fires you up, what stuff can be paid for, what are you really good at? Um, and then looking at what are the common patterns that kind of come up there. Um, and each of us are gonna be different, but um, I think inevitably then you start to arrive at things that I think that you were put on earth to do in some respect and that really, uh, you know, are gonna be your greatest contribution to humanity. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can get clear on those things and then, you know, there's a host of different business models you could build so that you're now building a business within that passion, right? Whether it's a course, a, writing a book, uh, building a mastermind, uh, creating a video series or, uh, you know, a software product around that thing or an app or, you know, there's so many ways these days. I think we live in such like an abundant mm -hmm. world. You know, the ability to build something over a weekend is pretty remarkable and it's easier than it's ever been. And yeah. so, you know, I think just at least beginning that journey of getting clear on, you know, what, you know, who you are and what really fires you up is something that I think a lot of people just breeze over. I know I did that. And when I ended Bitmaker and had kind of, sold that business and after four years of building it, found myself completely down and out. I knew that whatever I built next had to be something that I really enjoyed uh, because yeah, life life is short and you only have so many shots at building businesses, uh, you know, based on like say the average business takes you seven years to make successful, you know, seven businesses, 49 years, you only have so many shots at it, right? So mm. you wanna make sure you're building something that actually fires you up and gives you energy versus, I think, yeah. I think a lot of people, struggle with almost kind of facing defeat and just ad putting up with the fact that they're they're in this job this is how their life is going to be and there isn't any other way out hmm. or maybe there is a way out but they're they're too afraid to take that risk because to be honest like realistically if you are going to set up something or go down this new venture it is going to be risky a short period of time your income is probably going to drop mm -hmm. and you're going to have to work pretty hard to begin with to get this up and off the ground but when you do that the payoffs are going to be huge yeah there's so many people who i know and even people who 
you know, I'm friends with and watch them on social media. I'm just like, God, this guy or this girl has so much potential. Like I see the potential in them, but they're just, they don't, they, they can't capitalize on it. There's something pulling them back. Mm -hmm. And I think I saw that with myself as well, with uh, me being a personal trainer, I, I had this big fear of being on camera and I knew that if I, if I really wanted to elevate and scale everything, I had to have a presence online, particularly with, with YouTube. But there was just this fear of me putting myself out there and being on camera and being confident speaking on the camera. And I remember that the first few times I tried it, hated it, felt so uncomfortable and mm -hmm. gave up. But then I was like, no, I can't, I can't do this. Like I need to just overcome this barrier and become more confident speaking on camera. And honestly, it was the best thing that I could have ever done. I think when I was 20, 22, 21, 22, I realized the only thing I really cared most about was just fitness, going to the gym. Yeah. So I, I was trying to figure out how do I make a career out of this? And so far, I feel like I've done pretty good um, just from doing things which I really like to do. And I'm in a position now where Fortunately, I can wake up every day and literally do whatever it is that I want to do, work mm -hmm. with who I want to work with. And it's honestly the best feeling in the world. Like I don't understand why everybody doesn't try to achieve that. Yeah. Well, I think it's like what you're saying too, right? I think sometimes people have this false impression that they should just do things that they're good at right out the gate, right? Mm -hmm. Like you may, yeah, start making YouTube and because you're not good at it and it feels really weird and uncomfortable, they mm -hmm. just stop, you know, when really viewing that fear as maybe a sign that there's actually a massive reward on the other side of it and kind of reframing it to lean into it more. Mm -hmm. um, and inevitably through reps, through just putting yourself out there, you know, I think, you know, you look back to even Mr. Beast early videos, right? The guy looked insane, you know? And now he's like the top guy out there. And so a lot of it just comes from putting the reps in. I think too many people get too obsessed early on with, oh, I wanna get to 10,000 followers or 100,000 subscribers mm -hmm. or whatever. I'd much prefer to approach these platforms or these kind of activities as like, I'm gonna put a hundred reps in, or I'm gonna put a hundred videos out, um, similar to working out, right? Like mm -hmm. versus worrying how many pounds you've lost in the first month, yeah. just try to get to the gym 90 days in a row, you know? And if you can just do that, like good things will happen, the score will take care of itself. And so I think people need to approach oftentimes, whether it's entrepreneurship or being a creator or whatever it may be, in a similar sort of fashion and just worry about what you can control, which is the reps, uh, not so much the growth. What have you found that most founders struggle with to begin with when it comes to building a business? I think inevitably the thing that most founders will say that is the biggest struggle in the business is the people aspect of everything. Mm. Uh, you know, um, you know, hiring, onboarding, recruiting, you know, these things are tricky, you know, and they're arguably that's the most important thing you can do as you're scaling is find great people um, that are intelligent, high integrity, have high energy uh, that can help you build the vision for what you're looking to build. And so that's certainly something I've struggled over the years with, you know, like hiring is one part art, one part science, you know, and so when you're starting off, oftentimes you'll compromise a compromise a value or a competency because someone's a great person maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and then sure enough, you get working for six months, eight months and you go, damn, like I could have seen that. Like, mm. what was I doing, you know? Um, or they, just not a great have That difficult conversation. Yeah. Like, yeah, and then there's that part that's extremely yeah. difficult with it too, which is like, oh man, like this isn't working out. Like, you know, so on and so forth. So yeah, I think inevitably like, it's the people side that uh, has always been the most tricky. And yeah, I think it's what I've learned over the years is just to take my time. And like, maybe you wanna fill a role for a given company like yesterday, you know, your, com you know, your content's breaking and the operation's breaking, you need a content manager. And your energy and what you want is to hire someone tomorrow, you know? And yeah. so yeah, you start interviewing people, but people don't quite seem right. Like don't rush that decision, you know? even if you got to feel the pain for a few months while you search through, you know, a bunch of potential candidates, it's worth it, you know, to right. find the right person for the role uh, versus just the first person for the role. So uh, I would say beyond the people side, you know, just struggling with patience, you know, yeah. I think that inevitably, yeah, we, you know, it's easy to live in the world today, just expecting like a quick fix, 
Uber Eats brings food to your house right away. You know, Instagram, you get rewards on there right away. Like we're so, you know, dopamine addicted and trying to remember that again, like the greatest things in life require you to have long-term thinking and just to be patient for a bit um, is a kind of continual reminder and continual process. So yeah, developing that patience has always been something that's tricky. I found that as my following has grown and my audience has grown, it's become easier to hire people. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people out there who they love what you do. They've been following your journey for so long. They're just, they will do anything to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. So you automatically have just uh, this sea of people who are pretty skilled, but better than that. They're just so enthusiastic yeah. and honored to be able to to work with you. Yeah, no, I completely agree. We had a, a tech position open at Founder OS uh, a couple months ago. And we had this gentleman, uh, Samir, uh, reach out and he had been following the journey and what we've been building for the last like year and a half. And I checked out his portfolio, it was amazing. He had reached out to me on LinkedIn and he's like, listen, I wanna work here. You know, I'll work for free for the first month. And if it doesn't work out, I'll hire the next person and I'll pay their first month's salary. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's like a hundred million dollar offer for like, you know, hiring. I'm like, you, you, don't, you don't get that anywhere else. Like, unless you've kind of like shared a movement, shared some content mm. and have this like, you know, yeah, group of people that are really bought into what you're building. And so, yeah, no, I agree hundred percent. I think it's one of like the hidden benefits that people oftentimes don't think about mm -hmm. when they're building an audience, but then suddenly, yeah, your reputation and the movement that you're building out there creates this surface area for just amazing people that resonate with what you're doing to kind of reach out and become part of it. So, uh, yeah, no, it's definitely a, a massive benefit. What's your approach to building these businesses and getting to the stage where they ultimately just run themselves without you having to be too heavily involved? Yeah. What, 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 how do you see it? Yeah. So I think that every business, um, has an operating system. And so when I'm building a business, I like to take a systems approach to everything that I'm doing. Um, so hiring people is a system, recruiting people, there's a system, onboarding people, you know, making sure that you have all of the systems across your company all documented um, so that people aren't just coming on board and, you know, trying to figure out what the heck is going on because the house is a mess, you know, having everything nice and organized. I like to have every single task um, that are like the core tasks in the company all documented properly, having proper Loom videos that I'll film around those given tasks so that there's just a proper training mm -hmm. portal for like everything that we do. And that kind of continuously being built out so that there are playbooks for every role, documentation of each task, videos on how to do those things. Um, so that when someone comes in, in a sense, they're almost going through like an internal university that we have in the company to kind of like learn the ropes fast uh, versus having to kind of constantly ask people and figure things out. And so by no means is everything documented, mm -hmm. um, but we certainly take pride in kind of, you know, along the way as we learn new things and as we implement new processes, we document those things. And I think the other thing too is, you know, we live in a day and age where more and more things can be automated and you don't necessarily need people for it. And I think that there's sort of sometimes amongst founders, and I've been there, it's a bit of a badge of honor to say, I hired someone or I run a team of 35 people. Whereas I think we live in a day and age where you should ask yourself before you're hiring, how could this be automated? Mm. And do you really need someone for this? Or is this like a, a task that can just be automated so you don't even need someone for it? Or is this something you simply just build on a specialist or a contractor that just builds out that solution you need for a month? And then it's done versus needing to hire a whole role for it. And I think the thing to be conscious of is you let your team grow too big, too fast, and you quickly are running a, a pretty lot, chaotic lot spot, you know? And so making sure that, um, you know, all the roles there are conscious roles, you know, you're running a business that is tight with like a lean, mean team of weapons. Um, and, you know, everything's documented, you have great systems in place. And, you know, I think, you know, James Clear says you don't rise, to the level of your goals, you follow the level of your systems, right? Mm. And so when you have those good systems in place, you can ensure that like, as the company grows and as you seek to do bigger and bigger things, there's just a solid foundation there um, so that things can kind of run smoothly um, inside of it. So yeah, it's a lot of like the systems thinking, having the right people, and then inevitably always growing an audience around things so that, you know, oftentimes the cap on a business's success, the bottleneck is just leads. 
yeah. right? And if you just have a massive audience, you don't need to worry about that part. Whereas you see so many people on a treadmill of just ads, ads, ads. And if one month they turn off the ads, the whole business falls apart. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having that kind of content, that audience as part of everything I build day one um, is definitely like a superpower and strength and kind of competitive advantage that I always seek to have in any industry that I compete in. What's your most powerful platform that you have at the moment? Or yeah. is it evenly spread out? I know you're big on newsletters. Yep. You have your YouTube, but is there any in particular which you felt as though was the strongest for you? Yeah, so this may surprise people. So yeah, I have like around over 300,000 on LinkedIn and LinkedIn is a beast. This is on your this, your personal? Yeah, yeah. I don't know anyone with a yeah. profile that big. That's yeah, so impressive. about 300,000 there. And then in, in LinkedIn, because it's essentially a platform, which I know at times can be super cringe, uh, <laughs> like most things though. Uh, but you know, it's essentially just a bunch of people putting their resumes up there, right? So it's like the density of like real people doing real things is quite good uh, versus other platforms that may have a higher percentage of bots or whatever it may be, right? So you're getting pretty solid quality people there. And yeah, LinkedIn uh, cranks like a lot of, like loyal subscribers to what we do um, and is a different, you know, a big kind of leverage point for, you know, the businesses I'm building specifically with Founder Us, especially. How do you grow on LinkedIn? Yeah, so my approach- I, I, I have a profile and I, I think I post once a week, I just share like the podcast, yeah. but I never really looked at it as a powerful tool, which yeah. you've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think now as I do transition more into the business side of things um, and actually want to be surrounded by, you know, people who are elevated, who are on it, who are either looking for work or just looking to discuss anything business related. That's kind of the place to be. Yeah. Instagram is certainly getting a little bit wild now with the, uh, the type of content out there. Same with TikTok. It's just yep. a bit, you feel like you're just getting more dumb as you're scrolling down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here's how I see it. So I think for guys that are operating at like your caliber, I think it really for anyone too, it's important to, um, it's important to get the most bang from your buck and the most like leverage from your time. And inevitably what I like to do is deploy like a content waterfall system when I think about my content strategy. So you have a pillar piece of content. For me, that might be a thread on X right? So like a long form post on X or Twitter. And so that long form post on Twitter then becomes about 14 other pieces of content. It could become six short form tweets over the next two months. It could become two other newsletters that I create. It could become the concept and part of the script for a long form YouTube video. It could become the concept for a podcast. It could become a long form LinkedIn post and so on and so forth. And so essentially taking that one piece of content and then distributing it in sort of like 14 different ways where it's like cut up or used is kind of how I'd recommend doing things. So for you, you have a tremendous community on YouTube and on this podcast, and you put a lot of work into this. Your pillar content as an example might be something that you go over on YouTube and like maybe even the script or just at least the uh, you know, the transcript mm -hmm. of a given YouTube video. And then taking that and kind of the guts that maybe really resonated with people on YouTube or where when you look at your analytics after you see like a spike in the analytics, you're like, mm -hmm. damn, people really resonated with that concept. Let's take that spike. Let's make that a LinkedIn post with like a really awesome v photo along with it. And I think long posts with a great hook with a photo attached, you know, or how you can generate like a lot of views on LinkedIn. And so no videos, I wouldn't do any audio stuff, no short form vertical video, nothing like that. Just like really good text-based content. Um, but based on the data you're seeing from what's probably spiking in your video content, I think would be a no brainer way to stand out. Are you doing the writing yourself? Yeah. So uh, over the course of the last like year and a half, uh, you know, written about four threads a week, those four threads, so these are like 300, 400 word posts on X or Twitter, um, then have created this massive bank of written content I put out there. I also just finished the manuscript for a 50,000 word book. And so between the book, between the content for X, between about 70 newsletter issues I've published over the last year and a half, there's just this massive bank of content that I've made. And so I'm publishing my thoughts across all these platforms 
And then I also, you know, have a social manager, content team, people that can also help me package things up that I've said in solid mm. ways, right? So it's a combination of me putting, you know, free form, my own stuff out there, and then also getting some help here and there with just people packaging up stuff. Again, just whatever we can do to get the most leverage. I think that something that's helped me over the years is really getting clear on what is an ambitious hourly rate for yourself. And I learned this from Naval Ravikant. Oh. And you know, the idea of like decide on an hourly rate that almost seems a little bit outrageous. So for me, that's $5,000 for an hour. For someone listening, maybe that's 500 or $1,000. Pick something, it doesn't really matter. And then starting to like in good order as you start to make more profit in your business, 20K, 30K, whatever it is, considering trying to get rid of the tasks on your plate that are like $20 an hour, $30 an hour tasks as quick as you can. And the quicker you can kind of within reason document those things, get great people on board to do them and get yourself out of the soup of stuff that is kind of below your hourly rate. Mm -hmm. I think the quicker you can kind of elevate yourself and build more leverage in life. And so when I'm operating these own, like these kind of companies, these content platforms, I'm also just trying to think about you know, what's the stuff that is the best, most ultimate like leverage for my time. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, as much as possible, trying to get the right team around me to do the rest. Similar to what I think you've done on YouTube. Like when you think about your YouTube operation, I'm curious, like, where's that at today in terms of like the team behind it that you've built around you? So when I started, I mean, it was all done by myself and I'm sure anyone who's even got themselves involved with YouTube, the longest task by far is the editing process. Mm -hmm. So fortunately now I have- So you edited yourself? Uh, yeah, first, wow. two, first two years, That's everything amazing. myself. But I enjoyed it. I I like to, and I, I would argue, it helped me to become better on camera because For sure. you, you watch yourself back all the time. Mm. So you're seeing all these little weird, awkward things that you do. But on top of that, the, the benefit is that you are in complete control of how you want to be perceived by the world. So it can almost help strengthen your brand because you're putting yourself out there exactly the way you want to be seen or sometimes i guess it depends on the, the personality and the skill set of an editor some editor might not know what to cut out and what to keep in you know they really have to know you quite well your personality and how you want to be perceived to decide okay this is how i should present this to the world um i would have loved to have just been able to clone myself and then made that person just the best editor ever. But obviously that's impossible. So um, it got to the point where I had to obviously delegate. And now I'm in a position where my my most favorite videos by far is when I just, I go out there almost sometimes with no plan. Hmm. It's just like, let's just see what happens. There's no script, no nothing. Maybe I have a bullet point of like, okay, let, these are the, the main chunks of content which need to be captured. Chris comes with me, he films. Hopefully there's like interesting things happen. I'm engaging with interesting people. We do cool stuff. And um, sometimes that can, it can be a great vlog. Maybe it's an average vlog and I'm like, okay, I need to actually go off and do more things to make it better. Um, but it's pretty good. I think I have a, a thumbnail person now. One thing which I would probably need help with, and I think is the most underrated and important aspect of, uh, anything on social media and that's the the creation of the idea so it's actually whether you do it by yourself and just sit and think remove all the noise in your head and just constantly think about okay so what what ideas can i come up with what hasn't been done or what's already been done but maybe i can put my own spin on it or maybe having somebody you could have like a i don't know the exact title for it but maybe the the someone who was the head of the content strategy. So it's their responsibility to maybe come up with ideas or maybe put out a plan. So they're actually spending their full time analyzing what is trending on social media, what's not trending, what is gonna be suitable for you. And then they can present something to you. And then you have a discussion, brainstorm, go backwards and forwards and then think, okay, yeah, this is a good idea. Let's go and do that. Because ultimately now, like there's so much that has already been done and everyone's kind of just copying off each other but just trying to make it a little bit better or adding their spin to it. But every now and then there will be a very unique piece of content which has never been done before. And that usually is very successful. And it's one of the reasons why Mr. Beast is so successful because he just kind of comes up with these ideas which is just think, <laughs> how did you come up with that idea? It's never been done before. Yeah. So um, yeah, 
Uh, I think, yeah, to answer your question, having a team is very important, but I still think I would be better off if I just allocated more time to just thinking. Yeah. Because whenever I do, when I don't have that time to think about ideas, usually the videos I put out are not as good as they could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's interesting. YouTube, like something I originally like, you know, the, the strategy that you take on X or on LinkedIn or on Instagram oftentimes is like just good quantity with good quality, like consistency, like stick with it and just kind of like, you know, just build that out, build out a schedule for it and you're good to go. The thing that surprised me initially getting going with YouTube over the last like year and a half or so is just how high the bar of quality is mm. on the platform. You know, like you really, it's not about just, oh, publish every week and you'll be fine, yeah. which is sort of the vibe on X or LinkedIn to some extent. It's very much like the best ideas will win mm -hmm. and the quality bar is insanely high. Uh, so yeah, you've got like Netflix style documentaries yeah. which are going out there now. And I think it is, it is important to, I mean, to begin with, you're never going to be putting out the, this content, which is going to be super high quality. If anything, I would advise against that because to begin with, nobody's probably going to watch your content. So just get in the groove of putting some videos out. Yeah. But over time, the quality should improve and you should really just be spending more time and effort on creating these really good videos that are going to pop off and get over a million views because those are the videos which not only will generate the most in ad revenue, but it's going to bring you a load of new people and they're the type of videos that are just going to continuously get viewed year after year after year after year. Like that's why I love YouTube because the old videos don't disappear. Like on a lot of platforms, whether it be Instagram or TikTok, you put something up 24 hours, it's probably gone after that. Yeah. Maybe you get lucky and the platform decides to push it, might push it for a couple more days or maybe even more than that, but it's often quite rare. And then, there's not really that search feature. People aren't going to Instagram to search for a particular topic. They're searching for people or brands. So yeah, unless they scroll all the way down to something you posted six months ago, it's almost gone forever. Yeah, that was definitely, I think the power of platforms like YouTube, having SEO articles, like a blog, um, and then driving those kind of people to a newsletter where you actually own these people, I mm -hmm. think is super powerful. I think, yeah, being just, on a platform, whether it's Instagram, YouTube, whatever, and just pumping that platform over time without converting those people to an mm. audience you actually own is a huge risk. Cause we all know that these platforms kind of go up and down and you have good months, good years, slow months, slow years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hopefully though you have like an email list you've built out where you actually control that and you own that versus being completely reliant on these platforms, which gets a little risky. I know you mentioned uh, Loom before, I think you had, I was looking at a piece of content which you put out. You said there was seven pieces of uh, software or tools which can really help to improve the operations of your business. What do you What do you use? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I use a lot of tools, uh, but I also think I'll caveat this just to say I think a lot of founders when they're starting out are really like addicted to the tool side of things. Mm. Inevitably, like there's a for any given task, there's about five tools you could use to do it. What's gonna matter most is not the tool, it's the founder behind it. And <laughs> whether you're actually just good at, you know, leveraging the tool to then complete the given task. But with all that said, um, like I'd mentioned, I think having a newsletter is incredibly important. The best platform for newsletters is called ConvertKit. Uh, the reason why it's the best is that it allows you to uh, go and build out a bunch of email automations around what you do welcome series segmentation personalization so that you can customize your email sequences based on the intent of people joining which is incredibly powerful you know if you're creating a digital product i think kajabi is a great platform for that just allows you to quickly in a weekend whip up a website launch a course page and sell whatever your knowledge is pretty fast on the community side of things for people looking to create like paid communities or a community around their passion which i think is an aw awesome form of of leverage online uh, you know, there's a lot of platforms, whether it be Slack, Mighty, Discord, et cetera. My favorite is a platform called School, S-K-O-O-L. I think it's really great for having your community in there, any education that you have, and then a sort of schedule and a calendar for when you maybe want to do open office hours or have a, you know, a social hang with everyone from the community. Sam Owens has, he's the star, that, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like that platform. I think it's great. For websites, I've done a lot of research here and I think that the best web flat platform for SEO and for a really growing like a massive uh, audience on your website is Webflow. 
um, you know, super flexible, easy to use, great for SEO, um, and it seems to be where everyone's going. And then, you know, when you're thinking about then kind of building the operating system for your business and getting clear on, okay, these are all the core components of onboarding, the team, content, audience, monetization, sales, customer success. I think it's good to centralize all those systems into a Notion company wiki where just all that stuff's nicely organized so that people can refer to it, they can be onboarded to it, so on and so forth. When I'm then building out like the rhythm of the company um, and getting clear on like the different projects that we have going and managing individual people and what they're working on, I manage all of that in a platform called Asana. It was started by the first CTO of Facebook and he went on to create this project management tool called Asana and super powerful for having different tasks in there with due dates, with owners and managing a Kanban board to kind of see when these people are working on things from in progress to completed and every stage in between. And yeah, I mean, and then, you know, things that don't get talked about a lot are also just your own health as a founder. I think a healthy founder mm. creates a healthy business. And so some systems there, uh, I actually, when I was first becoming sober, uh, started using this app called Streaks. And in Streaks, it's the simplest app ever. Um, you can basically put in 12 habits that you want to develop streaks around. And all you simply do is every day when you do the given thing, whether it's eat healthy, meditate, uh, you know, go for a lift, whatever it may be, just kind of simply mark down in the product, just like, hey, I did this thing today. Um, and you're just trying to build up streaks mm -hmm. in the product. And so I found that for whether it was like going to the gym every day or just from stopping drinking. Um, I need that for stretching. There we go. Yeah, I have my stretching in there too. It's funny you put that. Yeah, so stretching's in there, uh, meditating's in there, all these just daily things. So super basic app, but you get a little bit addicted to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just building these streaks and not breaking the chain. Uh, which I think is like, again, I'm bigger on versus worrying about like the results of things and the outcomes. Over the years, as I've gotten older, my focus is now just like on the reps. And if I can just stay consistent with the reps of things, whether it's meditating, reading, stretching, publishing content, whatever it may be, I think that's where the real magic comes from. Mm. So those are a few of them. What's your approach to setting goals? I think this is probably going to be quite a relevant topic since this podcast is going to be published around the beginning of the year. So there's gonna be a lot of people who will be writing down or maybe they have written down their goals and they're set to try and achieve them as best they possibly can do. Mm -hmm. What's your approach? Yeah, so I think that goal setting at the end of the year especially is like really, really uh, awesome experience uh, and a great level up if you can do that right. As I've kind of gotten more and more experience as an entrepreneur, I actually try to begin that process earlier and earlier in the year. So I used to leave it for something that was like, oh, December 29th and 30th, when I have two days off on vacation, whatever, I'm just gonna journal for a bit and come up with my goals. For me now, my process starts like mid-November, like just getting a lot more serious, slowing down um, and beginning that process. And it generally begins with a reflection. Uh, there's a quote from Ray Dalio, which is pain plus reflection equals progress. And so I think it's really important to slow down for a second and think about your year, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, what were the people that really stood out that changed your life? What are the people that really, you know, sucked your energy? What were the experiences that really stood out that were rewarding, which things sucked your energy? Um, and getting clear on the things that you wanna lean into the next year and then the things that you wanna kind of avoid. Um, and oftentimes I find like a lot of just the plan for the year or the things that you kind of need to double down on just kind of emerge from that reflection. Mm -hmm. And then from there, um, I use, uh, you know, a vision board system I've built out, which is essentially just getting clear on, you know, your, the values, your 10 year vision of where you're trying to go, your three year vision from that, and then getting clear on, okay, what, what do I wanna get done by December 31st, 2024? And what do I need to do over the next 90 days? to get there mm -hmm. um, and not overwhelming yourself with you know a thousand things you wanna get done, but what are those like three to five big needle mover tasks that if you get those done in the next 90 days, like you will be successful. And so um, I like to take my time, get clear on those. And then, you know, within my companies, make sure that everyone's doing this exercise as well so that mm -hmm. everyone collectively is getting clear on the goals for the next 90 days, how their individual goals land up, ladder up to the company goals. Um, and ensure that we're just kind of like all operating in like the same direction versus swimming in different lanes in different areas and kind of all going, you know, all over the place. Yeah. So I did this pro the the process of going through everything and reflecting upon my year. And I, I did write a list at the beginning of this year. I achieved half the things I wanted to achieve. But I look back and I think I was quite ambitious with every single 
thing which I wanted to accomplish. And I feel as though that is one potential thing to be aware of is maybe don't set too many goals that are almost separate from one another. Maybe instead just think of like two or three really big things that you want to do. Yeah. And then just do everything in your power to achieve those things. Because if you, like you said, if you have a list of 10 things, 10 huge things, you, ultimately you have to kind of decide, well, which one of these is the priority and which one is going to be the most realistic. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. I think, yeah, there's that balance, right? Between creating goals that you 100% can attain and at the same token, like creating these stretch goals, right? That like you're saying, like you only accomplish 50% of the things. I'd say the positive side of that though, is like you're being really ambitious mm -hmm. and you're like stretching yourself to be like, hey, I wonder if I could just push myself this year, make it super epic and get these things done. Like that would be pretty insane. And I think, yeah, it's a, every person's got their own sense on that. For me, I think that balance is like, ideally you're completing around 70% of the things that you had outlined for that year. Mm -hmm. So you're being really ambitious and stretching yourself, but not able to quite accomplish all of them because they were that ambitious. Yeah. That's the kind of range that I like to do. But for other people, they're different and teach their own. I think then the most important thing with all of it is don't let it, which is what 99% of people are guilty of, is that it becomes this like once a year exercise, they close the journal, they yeah, put it aside, yeah, yeah. it moves down the shelf a bit over the years, and then they look you know, back at it the following December and they're like, oh shit, I forgot I even made that. So I think it's important to kind of, again, create some sort of system around it, which is like, for me, actually like add these things to Asana, like really organize these things in my calendar, like, you know, get started on creating these things now um, so that they actually come true. And they're not just like nice to have, so they're things that you are actually going to make happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then I make an exercise too, which is having like a personal board meeting with myself every month. And so, I think, you know, you hear about in public companies, the CEO has to meet with a board every, you know, quarter, talk about the performance of the company, how they're doing, how the team's doing, are they above numbers, below forecast, whatever. I take all those goals that I have for a given year, put that into a, a deck essentially, which is like a board meeting. And I just have it with myself every last uh, weekend of a given month. And so that Sunday, go grab a nice Americano, go for a little hike, go look at this deck that I've created, which is like my goals that I said I would get done that year, that quarter, the hires I need to make, the changes that I need to make, the things I need to learn, the you know, uh, new uh, goals that I have, whatever it may be, right? And just making sure that there's like a feedback loop there so that these things, again, don't just get buried and, mm -hmm. you know, get forgotten about. Did you achieve everything you wanted to achieve this year? No, I mean, similar to you, right? I think we're the same sort of cut from the same cloth in the sense of, I, I had some really, really ambitious goals, you know, growing the YouTube to a certain amount or growing the newsletter a certain amount or publishing my book this year. Like, mm. did I do, start all these things and do what I could control around them? Yeah. Did I end up publishing that book this year? No. Like I ended up realizing, oh, that's actually a whole can of worms. <laughs> yeah. And like creating a book is like, the editing process is actually really, really intense. And like, so I wrote the manuscript this year and I got done a good bit of it, but yeah, we didn't, we're not gonna publish it this year. We'll do it midway through next year. So these are examples of, you know, and that is an example. It's like, I'm actually proud of myself for where that's at, despite the fact that yes, it didn't get released this year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the work was put in. I thought I did a good job of what I could control. And maybe the goal was a little bit overly ambitious. Um, and so, yeah, similar to you, probably around like 60 to 70% of the things I wanted to get done this year were done. And then the rest of it will be things that I need to reevaluate. Did things change? I need to just remove those things. You know, maybe I was a bit distracted. Uh, are there things that I still have yet to do that I just need to double down on? Um, yeah, personally, I'm in this mode these days where quarter by quarter, year by year right now, it's kind of just more of the same stuff. Just keep hiring great people, serving founders better than anyone else delivering great results, growing a great audience of people that are, you know, you're delivering a lot of value to and just keep just putting in the reps and like playing the long game and it all kind of works out. Do you have a morning routine? Do you so, think you need one to be successful? Yeah, so on, so no, I don't think you need a morning routine to be successful. I think that, you know, people are different. There's no one size fits all to anything in life. I know for me, uh, the mornings are super sacred. Like I need my mornings to operate at a relatively similar way uh, to be my best self. And so I used to, you know, when I was younger, you know, kind of just wake up when I woke up and not be organized in the morning. And 
I oftentimes felt myself like kind of behind in the day. The mm -hmm. life was kind of happening against me versus like me kind of controlling, like controlling the game. And these days for me, like the a great morning starts the night before, you know, obviously getting a good sleep, but beyond that, just getting clear on what success looks like the next day. Like what are the five to six things in a ranked order you wanna get done that will make that given day successful? And then, you know, waking up at around the similar hour, but I'm not overly strict about it. Mm -hmm. And then kind of my big thing is not allowing meetings to happen as I first wake up. So I generally don't schedule any meetings until after 2 p.m. So that I just have like a bunch of time for deep work, for health, for going to the gym, meditating, these kind of things in the morning and can do that just at a nice pace. Don't need to rush it. And then, you know, have all the time in the afternoon uh, for, you know, meetings and all that kind of stuff, which being out here in Dubai is is great for that because yeah. I feel like it's kind of commonplace if you're working with people uh, in the States and such, your day doesn't really begin till four or 5 p.m. and doesn't stop till, depending on your day, like maybe nine or 10. So I feel like it's very conducive, at least this time zone for that. And I kind of learned that when I was traveling through Japan for three months, like recently, mm -hmm. it's just like, there's pros and cons to any time zone. The nice thing about this time zone here in Dubai is, yeah, like you just get so much time free. Yeah, in the morning you, while you, everyone's yeah. sleeping, it's really peaceful and you don't need yeah. to feel like, oh man, someone's gonna wanna do this or what's going on there. It's kind of, you're kind of head of the world a little bit. So yeah. it feels nice. The only downside I've experienced is uh, when it gets to a certain time, whether it be eight, 9 p.m., there's still people bombarding you with messages and you have to be either willing to stay up later to just do what needs to be done or have like a cut off time. Mm. So what I've started to do is, you know how a lot of people will set their alarm in the morning when to wake up. I set an alarm in the evening. Oh, that's fine. When to just stop doing work. Like, okay, close the laptop, put the phone away. Now is the time to start winding down and get ready for bed. Because it's very easy to get in, into the routine and cycle of staying awake until like two in the morning here because everything's open. Like right. I go downstairs and literally two in the morning, everything is still open. People are still walking around, which is yeah. something I love about Dubai, but is a, is a problem as well, because I weigh up what is more beneficial for me, the first few hours of the morning, if I wake up early, or the last few hours at night, if I go to sleep late. And realistically, the, the last few hours before going to bed, I'm not doing anything that great. Maybe I might watch a piece of content, which is, you know, it gives me a great idea. Mm -hmm. But what I can achieve in that morning, in the first few hours, if I wake up early is pretty impressive. And then before you know it, it's midday, you've literally done everything you need to do. Mm -hmm. And you still have the whole day ahead of you to do either whatever it is that you want to do or get started on that next task. But you yeah. just have to have that discipline of getting to bed early. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I never thought of that, but I'm gonna implement that probably, or give it an experiment with it. Yeah, because it's definitely easy out here just to kind of, get in the wave of mm. stuff going on and kind of you're you're in the mix, you're kind of meetings are happening or you're talking with different people on whatever over in the US or, mm. and before you know it, like, yeah, it's midnight, it, 1 a.m. and uh, it's fine. <laughs> like, but like, yeah, I'm sure I felt like this in Japan when I was there, like it does start to add up a little bit because you're like, okay, this is pretty late. How long are you in Japan for? I was there for three months. Cause that is, that's on the list. I'm gonna try to go there in, April next year nice. with the team. I'm trying to decide how long to go for. I feel as though two weeks is the absolute minimum. Mm -hmm. But overall, was your experience good? Yeah, Japan's a beautiful country, great spot. Tokyo, Kyoto was in Edo in the kind of like nature area there for a while. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great place and was on the bucket list for a long, long time and just really needed to be like, okay, I gotta like get there and, and make this thing happen. So. The next spot I'm trying to get to next year is India. It's been on the list for oh. a long, long time. Never been, and I know it's only like an hour from here. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, I'm, you know, that's the one thing I'm really excited for now being in Dubai is just how accessible all these other countries in this region are obviously, oh, yeah. and just the lack, like I haven't been to many of these countries, never been to Africa before, never been to India. And so being able to kind of go to these spots that have been on the list for a long, long time and have them that close is something I'm excited for. Yeah, the amount of places that you can go to that's under, under a, a five hour plane journey is pretty crazy. Yeah. Like even Maldives is four hours away. You've got all these countries in the Middle East. There's a lot of beautiful places. Yeah. Do you find it weird uh, just packing up and moving here? 
I mean, right. it definitely sounds weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, I've kind of been nomadic for the last 11, 12 years. Um, and so for the last three years, I was looking for a home base. And I had tried, you know, LA, I considered New York, maybe Mexico City, um, all over the place. I'd gone and traveled all over the world. And, um, you know, I had started talking to a number of friends that were here in Dubai. And um, yeah, it just, it started to sound like a pretty awesome place, like really, really high caliber founders building awesome things. A lot of access again to a, an area of the world that I really wanted to explore. Um, and um, yeah, just a really conducive like environment to like focusing, it's got nice weather, it's clean, no crime, mm. uh, among many, many other benefits that it was like, okay, there's enough sort of patterns here that I've seen that kind of check off different criteria of what are important to me in a kind of home base. Um, and uh, without even having been here before, I've just like Dubai checks enough boxes that I just feel good about it. Like the people that are there aren't stupid people and they're clearly enjoying it a lot. So I just kind of trusted that. And I just had an intuition that I would it would be right. And I feel like that's something that is important to follow your gut sometimes. And if it just feels right, just go for it. And uh, whether that's like starting that next business or traveling to that spot or saying hello to that girl that you're attracted to, like into just your intuition telling you like, there's something there, like I gotta do this, I think is something that's important to follow. It's not necessarily, it doesn't always make sense in the brain, but you're, you know, you can feel it in your body. And so, yeah, Dubai was kind of one of those things. I was like, you know what, this feels right. And now or never, and like anything in life, it's not like, you know, there's one way doors in life and then there's two way doors, right? Like it's one of those things where you can move to Dubai and you can live here for a little while. And if you wanna go somewhere else, you can go somewhere else, right? So mm. it felt like that kind of decision, which is like, you can make it and you can always go wherever else. So. Yeah. I feel like one of the best things you can do if you feel as though your life is in a bit of a rut and like you just need some inspiration or you need to shake things up, just relocate. Yeah. That is one of the best things you can do. Like there's, it's one of the biggest mindset shifts that you could possibly have just surrounding yourself in a different environment with different people and just being in a situation where you kind of have to force yourself to get a little bit uncomfortable. I remember when I first moved out here, it was, before a lot of people started to move out here. So I remember when I kind of first made the announcement, everyone was like, why the hell are you going to the Middle East? Like, that's so weird. But I'd been here a few times and I just had a good, uh, I don't know, I had a good impression that it was going to take off. It definitely took off. But it was it came with its challenges because I came here alone. I didn't know anyone. And I think that was the, the biggest struggle because especially if you if you live somewhere and you have a really great, circle of friends and your family are there that can be the most challenging things to move away from that i think for me the biggest challenge was uh not being able to see my family as much as i would like to but friends like you i have my friends back home but i feel like fortunately because of the, the platform which i've been able to create for myself it is it's certainly easy to meet up with people it's just difficult to find people who are like really genuine yeah and are not there to meet up with you because they want something or they want to be associated with you they're just like pretty cool people who yeah you know, just want to hang nice nice people it's um it's definitely something you need to do if you've been in the same place your whole life you need to get out and see the world i agree yeah i think it needs to be a bucket list thing that everyone has to at least live somewhere outside of their original hometown for at least a year of their life I think it's like the best education you can get and really helps you flex a lot of like skills that, yeah, just make you a better person, you mm -hmm. know, meeting new people, uh, you know, putting yourself out there, you know, switching up your routine, um, you know, yeah, just starting anew and then building yourself back up. And yeah, I think there's a lot of just invaluable skills, both conscious skills and like sub subconscious stuff that just happens as you. I feel like I, I live these uh, two lives at the moment. So I have my... Dubai life, which is from September till May, and then June onwards, the past few years, that, that, that's been the months of travel. So like you, I've been a bit of a nomad. And as good as that has been, I, I, I miss the routine which I have here. Yeah, And I don't really know what to do this next summer. I don't know whether to just go to one place, stay put, 
and to try and be as productive as I possibly can be whilst trying to kind of match the surroundings and the environment which I have here or whether I kind of continue to travel but instead of it being like a laid back vacation style travel it's more of a productive travel where wherever I go I'm going there for a purpose and it's to collaborate it's to do business whatever it might yeah. be I think um, a trip to the states is long overdue I've been there before I've been to a lot of the big cities but it's been years since oh, I've wow. been there and I've noticed one thing about Americans is they don't a lot of Americans like to stay in America yeah they don't often venture out that often yeah so um i feel like i probably have to do at least a month in america yeah next summer yeah i prefer like kind of like slow traveling yeah. which is you know yeah when i was you know getting started 23 bouncing around europe or southeast asia it was like a few days in a city and then the next place and then the next place you can, and sleep, you can sleep rough at that age yeah, yeah, yeah exactly and so everything was easy and life was good and you're just so hungry just to experience all these things and i still am very hungry to experience a lot of different cultures but i've kind of learned the best way to do that in a sustainable way is just like slow down find your gym there mm. find some like interesting folks around that you maybe want to hang with for the next two three months and you know find you know the cafe you like and maybe a co-working spot or you know just a nice like neighborhood that you like in that area just to kind of like experience it for real mm. and just like slow down and settle into the spot versus feeling like okay pack up again next spot i feel like yeah i mean to each their own and there's a different kind of time in life for different kinds of travel but i really like just being able to settle down and slow down in a spot and i but, agree with you too on the routine is like something that gets really addicting where, where are the places you've been to where you felt like you could be most productive or the place which gave you the most sort of inspiration for ideas and things like that yeah i think that i mean a couple of cities that come to mind are like new york city and la i feel like for depending on what you're doing they're like a pretty hu big hub for a mm. high caliber of people and you know i think there's a lot of us that are have this insatiable drive to be like number one in our area or just like learn a lot and be a sponge for just great ideas and people doing big things and i think that like new york city is like a mecca for that right and in la in its own way is as well and so those are cities like i'll come back to generally about every year or at least every two years just to settle down stay for a few months and reconnect with friends and get inspired and those are places for sure and then you know, there's also other cities like Berlin as an example that I think is a beautiful city, great people, lots of inspiration, really cool scene there. And yeah, it's a city that's cool to touch down in. And those are a few, how about for you? I found that I can get quite a lot of stuff in Marbella. So Mar that's in Spain. Okay. Marbella. It's in Costa del Sol. So it's a Interesting. very beautiful scenic area. Uh, there's lots of hills there. It's got a beach. Um, main reason why I like it is because it's got very good gyms. Okay. So that's now wherever I travel, if I'm going to locate anywhere, the gyms is the most important thing for me. That's, that's what I care about the most. So it has to have good gyms. If it doesn't, I don't want to go there. Okay. It's one of the reasons why I ended up coming to Dubai because it had like great gym facilities. Cool. Um, weather, extremely important. It needs to be as sunny as possible for as many <laughs> days as possible. And there needs to be a little bit of a buzz about it. There needs to be people coming in and out. There needs to be cool people there. Um, I feel like if I, if I go anywhere that's too quiet, I just the opportunity to collaborate and network with people is not great, which should be fine if the purpose is to just unwind and mm -hmm. get away from people. Yeah. Um, but I, especially at this point in my life, I need to be where the action is. Yeah that's where everything will just you know you've got endless amounts of content to make and endless amounts of people to collaborate with i liked bali i feel like bali is a place where if i needed to i could live there the downside of bali is it's um probably a place which has has peaked and it's had its day like i think it had its prime years a couple of years ago when it was kind of a little bit more relatively unknown and only a few people kind of knew about it now i I mean, I went there last it was last year, and the the biggest problem with Bali is the traffic. Like they don't have the infrastructure to support the amount of people that are going there, particularly okay. in Chengdu. So, just getting a, getting around anywhere is an is a nightmare. It's a headache. You have, mm. You're driving around on a scooter. Um, it's just too chaotic. But I like the nature. I like that there's you know there's people there. The nature's cool. 
The problem is when you go to some of these places that have this laid back vibe, it rubs off on me. It doesn't always have this effect on everyone. But if I get like, it tends to be the place as well in Spain, they have this, this manana attitude, which is like, oh, we'll do it tomorrow. They have siestas in the afternoon. On Sundays, everything is shut. Sometimes now midweek, they decide to just shut things as well. And it's just like, there's things I need to do, but I can't do them because mm -hmm. everything is shut. And then there's people I need to speak to, but I can't speak to because they're having a nap. And it's like, this is not, I don't want to be surrounded by these people. <laughs> it happens every single summer. I just end up being this, I turned into a lazy Spanish person. So uh, I, as much as I like Spain, I feel like that's probably somewhere where I would spend more of our, my later years. I'll still be going there in and out, but you know, right now it's time to capitalize on what I, I have in front of me. Like mm -hmm. there's an opportunity for me to really, you know, take things to the moon if I want to. Mm -hmm. um, I need to have my foot on the pedal, not take it off. And I think one of the good things I did in my, late twenties is I did have a, I wouldn't call it time off, but I definitely enjoyed the fruits of my labor. So in my mid twenties, I did, I worked very hard. Um, especially when I was getting my YouTube channel off the ground in 2017, in particular, that whole year was just dedicated to just trying to build my channel. And I did, I think we, I grew 300,000 subscribers in a year. And that, I mean, all, obviously a lot of my problems were solved at least financially when uh, that happened. And then I ended up coming out of a relationship and then all of a sudden I just had this ultimate freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. So then I started traveling and then that just helped to make the content more interesting. I could meet up with people all around the world that were in a similar situation to me, content creators, fitness people. That's when I really started enjoying life. And I was like, oh yeah, okay. I feel like I know what I like now and I'm in charge of what it is that I want to do. So I had periods in my, I remember when I was, I looked back to 2019 and that was a year where there was just, there was literally no responsibility. It was so fun. It was just me and my cameraman who just turned out to be my best friend as well, Louis, Louis Armstrong. So financially things were great. I had multiple sources of uh, revenue. My overheads were limited because I didn't have a team of people at that point. I just had one guy. Yeah. And he didn't really charge a whole lot because I was just, you know, taking him along for the ride. So uh, we could just literally do whatever we wanted. I think twice a month, we would just like pick somewhere, and just go travel there, just go film some cool content, have fun. It was when I was drinking a bit more and I was partying a bit more. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a hell of a lot of fun. I don't think I'll ever get that feeling back. I feel like uh, there's just... I have more responsibility now. You know, right. when you've got people on the payroll and there's just a, a duty to supply people with the, the content which they want to see, particularly with the podcast. Yeah. So uh, it was that was definitely a good year in my life, which I appreciate. And I feel like everybody at some point needs to do the things which they've always really wanted to do. Don't just work your ass off until you're 40 years oh, old yeah. and then you miss, you've missed out on your prime years and you know doing those things which you really wanted to do because when you if you get married or you do have kids there's there's a lot which you you know you can't necessarily do anymore i'm sure you, you can do little bits of it but you can't have that complete freedom yeah. and zero responsibility and just go like really wild so right. i think when you got kids you know there's definitely a lot of things i would not have done in 2019 if i had, had kids yeah no, and I think the interesting thing too is as you travel around, I feel like whether oftentimes pretty consciously, like you're talking about too, you start to develop this like criteria for, you know, what makes a great location mm -hmm. for living, right? Like great Wi-Fi, great access to a gym. If you're single, a great dating scene. Mm -hmm. If you're a founder or an entrepreneur, like great opportunities, uh, you know, great weather, um, you know, affordability maybe, whatever it may be, right? Mm -hmm. Access to nature. And then kind of able to like apply that criteria to different places in the world that you could potentially live or go to, you know, and then be able to quickly evaluate whether something's gonna be conducive to your happiness or something that's like not going to be. So like yeah. being way out in nature right now, you'll over index on the nature part, but like, yeah, opportunity, dating scene, whatever is gonna just like fall flat versus, you know, yeah, you look at a place like Dubai and you're like, okay, great weather, great for opportunity, great things going on, great gym, you know, and able to kind of evaluate a place pretty quickly, which is similar to how I kind of was able to evaluate Dubai pretty fast. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I have these 
criteria in my brain as to what makes a a great location. You can pretty quickly evaluate whether it's going to be something that's going to be conducive to your your habits, your happiness, your routine, or something that's going to get in the way. You know what's pretty interesting as well, because I, I always have a debate with myself about this, and it's how much I spend on uh, like Airbnbs or hotels, particularly Airbnbs. And this has been the case over the past two years because I have a very nice apartment here in Dubai, and when I tr travel, the problem is is I have very high expectations of the quality of life I have now. I'm a bit of a princess. So when I travel, I, I want to match what I have here. And it's very difficult to do that in other countries. And particularly when you are going to places when it's their peak season for tourism, you're, right. you're paying a premium price. So anyway, I've um, when I do travel, I like to travel well. And I do wonder, like, maybe I should try and not be so excessive with the spending. But one thing which I've learn from staying in nice places and nice Airbnbs is every time I go to a different Airbnb, I learn something from it. And I learn what it is that I like and what I don't like. So it might have a particular feature or style or view or location where I think, hmm, this is something which I want my future house to have. And then there's other little things which I might be like, hmm, actually, this is really annoying. Like, I definitely don't want this to be in my future house and yeah. i'm talking about the future house which you end up spending the majority of your life in so it will come to the point when i do build this wherever i choose to build it it's going to be like the the ultimate most perfect place for me yeah. that i could possibly build and if i hadn't had that experience of living in so many different places and living in so many different locations i wouldn't have really known what it is that i like and i probably would have just accepted some house or whatever it might be that is either on the market or maybe my partner chooses and I may have gone ahead with purchasing it and then might find out that a couple months in or a year in that I actually hate the place. Yeah. So I, I like that now I'm at a point where I truly know what it is that I like and what I don't like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another frame that I've had to change to from traveling around a bunch is like, yeah, like you're saying, like, you travel to like an Airbnb or wherever it may be, and you're like, damn, like this is expensive, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think right now in Dubai, like this spot I've got for the next little bit is like 20K a month. Um, Dollars. Yeah. And okay. uh, so it's a pretty nice place then. And so, but then I think about like the frame I think is kind of back to the leverage piece, right? Which is like decide on an ambitious hourly rate for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so if the hourly rate's $2,000 an hour, $5,000, whatever it is, the most valuable thing in any given location is that you can focus. Yeah. And if you can just focus, I don't care where it is. Mm -hmm. Like, and it can get quite outrageous. Like maybe that involves you, you know, yeah, be your full princess self and like really go for it, right? But inevitably, if that's gonna allow you to focus and feel good and feel healthy, and it's got the gym nearby, that's gonna allow you to be, on your peak performance and you're gonna make great content, build a great business, hire those people, be able to take calls the way you want to, whatever it is, right? And just like be a conducive environment for you being in the zone. There's an ROI to that mm -hmm. versus like cutting corners, making some sacrifices. And then before you know it, you're like not feeling quite optimal. That's the most expensive thing you can do in the month, mm -hmm. I think for like really high performance people. And so yeah. for me, I kind of had to switch my brain over the last decade to being more like that, which at times, yeah, it's pretty outrageous. Like I'm spending amounts on a given location that I would never imagine I'd be spending. Mm -hmm. But it's like in the name of, yeah, like if I'm feeling good, if I'm in the zone, I can pay for this place and then some, no problem. And kind of switching your brain from scarcity thinking to abundance thinking. Yeah. And then also just, again, just thinking about like the ROI of something. You know, I think too many founders early on are too focused on just an expense line item, right? And you can quickly go, oh, that that hire, that's expensive. I'm gonna save money and hire this person. But you're not looking like this person can, can do 20X what that person can do. And yeah, they cost 5X more, but there's a no brainer mm. return on that hire. You know, and same deal, I think sometimes with like your location as well. You know, maybe, yeah, you're somewhere that's a little bit more expensive, but if you're gonna be 200% more productive, feel way better and show up way better, whether it's in content or in meetings or in deals or whatever you're doing, yeah, that place pays for itself versus the place that you could cut some dollars from. That's at least how I view it now. Yeah, like you just can't underestimate how much of an impact your environment will oh, have on God. your mindset. 100%, yeah, people, yeah. It's like we, we are a product of our environment. And so if that environment is like dialed in, mm -hmm. you are going to be good, you know?
even when people ask me how much I spend on like rent and accommodation, I just, I, I don't even bother telling them sometimes. I think mm -hmm. it depends on who I'm speaking to hmm. because the person that is quite frugal and maybe isn't earning a huge amount of money, they will, they will never understand. Like for you to try and justify why you're spending that much money on living somewhere, they, they can't comprehend it. Yeah. But it has it's such an impact. The few times when I did, this was after I'd moved into this place and I traveled and I thought, oh, do you know what? I'll just, I'll cut corners a little bit and try and save. And it, I ended up not really enjoying that experience of uh, the, the travel aspect of it because of where I was staying. Like it just put me in a weird mindset. And it's sometimes the case when, when I travel, uh, there'll be some times when uh, a business class seat is just so outrageous. You know, sometimes they really do just jack it up. Yeah. To sometimes it can be more than four thousand dollars, and I'm just like, that really is outrageous for just like, you know, five or six hours. Mm -hmm. But then when I do fly economy, I'm just like, oh, <laughs> like I really do not like this, and you're just kind of wishing that you were back in in business class again. But ultimately, it's just that's the motivation. It's like, okay, well, if this, I remember the first time I went business, I was just like, I'm, I don't want to go back from this. This is, this is now the yeah. level which we're at. So let's go back home and figure out how we can be earning this amount of money to be able to afford this kind of lifestyle. And I don't go crazy with spending on materialistic things. I don't care it's that much about yeah, same. Uh, fashion. I don't like really spending money on nights out alcohol things like that i just i like to spend on travel mm -hmm. that's a big thing and my my home comforts yeah no, i'm the same way and i think yeah just you have your given routine those core things that you do that really get you feeling good get you in the zone like yeah just get those things right you know and if they cost a little bit more or whatever as long as you're motivated you're producing you're in the pocket like that's just kind of the cost of doing business. I think like that's also part of the reason sometimes being a founder or being a creator of something is can be a little bit lonely, right? Is like mm -hmm. these, you talk about these expenses with someone and you feel a little bit like, oh, like, you know, should I be saying this? But the truth is too, if you told them how much you were paying on your headcount per month, that would seem outrageous too, Yeah. right? But the reality is like, yeah, guys like us are spending, you know, quite possibly like hundreds of thousands of dollars every month on the team and yeah, thereby like, if you think about the most valuable player sometimes of like the person that's actually orchestrating that team, like you need to make sure that that person is feeling good to make sure that the empire runs smoothly mm -hmm. versus like, yeah, skimping around on expenses. And then before you know it, you're drained, you're burnt out or yeah, you're just wasting a bunch of time. So yeah. What what are you doing for your uh, sort of health routine? Is there any hacks which you've implemented to allow you to be performing at your best? Yeah, so for me, I mean, one of the best things I think that anyone can do, and I know you're big on this, uh, is getting your blood work done. Mm -hmm. um, I think that getting your blood work done, getting like a good understanding of like what's actually going on in your body allows you to then, whether it's supplement or implement new habits, like getting better sleep or cutting out substances or whatever it may be, just becomes sort of like data-driven versus just some guessing game. Yeah, um, just popping all these different pills yeah. and not really knowing if you should be exactly. having them or not. Yeah, so I really like to measure that and get that done at least twice a year just to kind of monitor different changes I'm making and yeah, just kind of gamify good health. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, in addition to that, um, yeah, I think like another, you know, kind of random hack on the health side is really doing like an energy audit of the people that you're around. I think there's a lot of people that look at their life situation and I've been there and wondered like, man, why am it, it's still not working out for me, you know? And why am I not where I wanna be? And then you look at the kind of people that you're hanging out with and you're like, damn, like, this is why. Like I'm around yeah. people that like drain my energy, make me feel like crap. Like it's the same old conversations day after day leading us nowhere. And so I think a big thing to your health too is like being surrounded by healthy people. You know, again, when I kind of became more sober and, and you know, kind of pursued a bit of a different lifestyle, like, a lot of my friends changed as part of that too, right? And started to surround myself with people that valued the things that I value. And so uh, I think, you know, that's something that's really big for me is like just being really conscious about who I'm around. Uh, because I think that, you know, again, your environment, like we were talking about, like affects a lot of things and the people you're around, you're very much a reflection of the five people you hang out with the most. And then lastly, something I'm really, really big on is like play, like fun, adventure. And so every six weeks trying to take a bit of a soul trip 
And so going somewhere pretty spontaneous, super random, just that like, you know, get away for at least four days, unplug, get away from my phone and just have some fun and be a kid, you know? So here, I think like in the next know, five weeks or so, I was thinking about going to Amman. It like, oh, sounds yeah, like yeah. really yeah. cool. I've never been and kind of like a lush nature oasis in the middle of the Middle East and seems kind of cool. And sounds like it's like a two, three hour drive. So rent a car, get out there, mm -hmm. go on a little adventure and just like get outside and go experience things. And I think it just kind of breaks the mold, you know, some of what we've been talking about on the travel side, just putting yourself in a weird situation, going somewhere new, getting outside, experiencing nature, getting off your phone, I think is just good for our brains these days when we're just so connected. And so, yeah, just like, and especially when you're building things, right? Mm -hmm. There's just like requests coming left, right, and center. And the next thing you gotta do and the next task you gotta complete and being able just to leave that all behind you for a few days and just disconnect with some good people, I think can be very therapeutic and, and really healthy. Uh, so those are a few things. Did you, did you come here with uh, a partner or did you come? Yeah, my girlfriend. Okay. Yeah. How do you find managing work and relationship life and balancing that? Yeah, it's certainly one of the greatest challenges I have for sure. Just not that it's like insanely hard or anything like that, but. She got a job. She works with me actually as our creative director at Founder OS. So Oof. yeah, so it's a whole. Gamble. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, so it's it's been great though. and But it's definitely a whole new realm, not something like I'm super experienced with working with a partner um, and. Are you, uh, are you working in the same place? Uh, so like I, I, you work remote, I imagine. Yeah. Home. So you, she's around when you're working. I mean, we'll work like from different cafes or we'll do our own okay. thing. So we're not like, you know, it's not like we're in the same room the whole day or something yeah. like that. So no, it's very like chill that way. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we met when I was in Puerto Escondido, Mexico around 11 months ago. And yeah, I've been traveling together since. And uh, she's Mexican. No, she's Colombian. Colombian. And so nice. um, we basically, yeah, she runs all the creative. So yeah, like the animated videos you talked about on Instagram. And oh, she, she does that. Yeah. And then uh, a lot of the design in the website, founderwest.com and other things like that. Like that's all her. And so- Women have a really good eye for that, I find. Yeah. I've noticed too, and I don't, I, I don't know, this is a random observation, but just a lot of like Colombian women have an insanely amazing eye for design. I don't know, super random. At least that's my own experience over the last couple of years. Like we have about four really, really, really talented Colombian women on our team that are like insanely talented with design, creative direction, animated videos. Uh, yeah, like in the, in the aesthetic and like the taste is like just unparalleled. And so, yeah, so we work together and, you know, candidly, I think there's a lot of things we have figured out around that. And then I'm sure there's still I mean, a whole realm of stuff that, we'll figure out from mm -hmm. it, but it's been really rewarding. And yeah, it's it's nice, especially on the creative side to have a partner that like just has your back and is really there to kind of make sure that you show up in a way that feels authentic and that's true to you. I feel like I need to have a business trip to Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's, it's, it's somewhere I wanted to go for a long time. Nice. I mean, I would love uh, to go with a couple of my friends. Is it as good as people say it is? Yeah, Colombia is amazing. Uh, great people, great culture, great lifestyle, uh, super affordable for people, I think, that are making like USD and traveling there. If you're going there for a bit, like, you know, it's optimal that way. Uh, yeah, and like gorgeous scenery. So, yeah, I know Bogota, Medellin, Cartagena, like all great spots. Mm -hmm. What's your plans then for next year, apart from maybe publishing the book? Mm -hmm. You got any other big things in mind which you want to achieve? Yeah, so like I mentioned, the mission at Founder OS is to create like the greatest founder education and community platform in the world. And so really doubling down on that experience, like creating amazing content for founders, helping kind of them with proven systems to grow their audience, their team, their monetization, and their content. So that's gonna be really big um, and just tripling down there across all platforms. Uh, we uh, run uh, these really epic founder experiences a few times a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we, well, we've got one planned for Mexico City that we're gonna really go big with. Um, you should come out if you're around. Mm, when's that? Uh, it is March 21st to 24th. Um, so yeah, if you're around, we'd love to have you there. Uh, and then uh, we'll probably do one in September in uh, Saudi Arabia, I think. And so just, yeah, just is really epic, like almost like a founder camp uh, with just really high performance, high caliber, heavy hitters. Um, part education, part experience. Yeah, those, those things that they literally are life-changing, like the people you meet. Yeah. It can completely shift the direction which you're heading in. Yeah. 
Or maybe well, you could have a conversation with one of them and say, oh, so this is what I'm doing. And then they might be like, well, have you thought about yeah. doing it this way instead? And you're just like, exactly. Oh my God. Yeah. So no, it's exactly that. And yeah, so uh, we've got some of that going on. Then yeah, getting the book out there, which I'm super excited by. So, um, and then, you know, a lot of it is just really uh, the team, we'll probably get the team up to like 32 people on that side of things. Um, and then at Herb, uh, just kind of more of the same, just continue to double down. And so basically just getting these two businesses to the next level to, you know, multiple eight figures each um, is sort of the next milestone. And yeah, just honestly, that just having fun along the way too. So like on a personal level here in Dubai, looking to meet great people, great to meet you and, you know, other really high caliber people here and just, yeah, just give back to the community here too. It seems like a really like thriving kind of like entrepreneur and creator scene, but also something that offers a lot of potential just to give back to it versus just take from it. So excited just to give back, meet new people, help out and yeah, just set some roots here and then travel around the surrounding area just to experience a bit of what this area has to offer. Hopefully go on a safari, maybe travel Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, we'll see. Do you know what, I, what stands out about you from a lot of the people I've spoken to so far is I feel like you, you really have that, the work and the life balance in order, very similar to me. Like a lot of people who I've spoken to who are, you know, they're very high performing. They've got these big companies that are hugely successful worth a lot of money, but they, I wouldn't want their life. Mm. If you know what I mean? Like they're, they're, they're all about the work, which is admirable. But sometimes I think there's like a, I don't know, there's a, there's a limit. Yeah. You know, for, for me personally, that's, that's not the life I want to live. Like I want to, yes, I want to work hard. I want to achieve my goals, but whilst I'm on this planet, I want to live a good life Yeah, and see a lot, do a lot, experience a lot and do that whilst I can, whilst I'm still young and, you know, have the freedom to do so before I kind of start a family. Yeah. So I feel like you've, you've got that good balance. Yeah. I mean, that, I think it's something that all of us like we'd be lying if we said like it wasn't a continual sort of, you know, yeah, just thing that you have to constantly reflect on, right? Like, mm -hmm. how am I going a little too hard right now? Or do I need to kind of pull back, take a break, whatever. So I think it's something that we're all still figuring out. But uh, yeah, I think it's important, you know, in life to do like the rocking chair test, you know, and kind of like when you look back on your life, you know, what are you gonna be most proud of? What are the things you may regret? And I do think that working too hard is something that you could look back on your life and regret. Mm -hmm. Now, I think working hard to build your dreams and build something valuable and build a movement and make an impact is really important. And there's certainly a time and place for working really, really hard and giving something your all. But you know, as you start to then get thriving and you know things are happening for you, if you just become too addicted, I think, to just working hard all the time, all in, while it can be really admirable, and I think people like Elon Musk are a real good example of that, <laughs> uh, I think there's also a host of other people that yeah, trying to then find like, okay, you've maximized that area of your life, but like, what about your health? What about your family? What about your friends, your relationships, your faith? Mm. Um, whatever it may be, like how are those areas of, or those buckets of your life doing? And I think trying to be a bit more, yeah, getting clear on what those buckets are in your life and being well-rounded about those buckets um, so that you don't just over-index on something at the cost of other important things that you'll come to regret when you're 80 years old. So mm. yeah, I think it's just trying to future-proof your decisions now. Mm. Awesome, man. So where can people find you on socials? You've got the Herb account, which yeah. I imagine is very popular for people who smoke weed. Yeah, and that then uh, popular. You've got your YouTube channel, your Instagram. Yeah, it's all under Matt Gray. You'll find me across all those. You can check out founderwest.com as well if mm -hmm. uh, you're interested there. And um, yeah, I just want to say thanks so much and looking forward to hanging here in Dubai and appreciate you having me on. No problem, man. Thank you very much.